location for uh, the needs of our young folks in understanding their own uh, mental health and uh, navigating that. So to tell you a little bit more about the professorship and the recipient, I'd like to introduce uh, Jean uh, Lackamp as our newly appointed chair in the Department of Psychiatry at University Hospitals. Uh, Dr. Lankamp completed her undergraduate degree at the College of Worcester in 1993. Uh, I used to bike down there every year when I biked all the way to um, Cincinnati for the American Cancer Society. Um, and she completed her MD degree uh, at Northeastern um, Ohio University's College of Medicine, Neomed, in, in 2003, uh, and then a psychiatry residency at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinic, a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine at George Washington University Medical Center, and then she joined the faculty here at, in University Hospitals. She trained as a consultant liaison psychiatrist, uh, understanding the, the interactions between psychiatry and medicine and the comorbidities of those to specialty areas. Um, an avid educator, she teaches psych psychiatry trainees from medical students to fellows um, and rotating trainees in other disciplines, internal medicine, family medicine, and the like. In addition to her direct patient care and education, she's also well aware of the issues of physicians and physician trainees and their own uh, mental health needs, and has been past president of the Cleveland uh, Consultation Liaison Society and the Cleveland Psychiatric Society as a fellow of the Academy of Consultative uh, liaison uh, psychiatry, a fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, and a member of the Ohio Psychiatric Physicians Association. Been voted best doctors in America a number of times, uh, and received the Faculty of the Year uh, award from her own residence a short while back. So without further ado, I'd like Jeannie to come up. Um, we'll introduce Dr. Lee, and then Dr. Romero. Jeannie. Good afternoon, and thank you, Stan. Uh, I'm Dr. Jean LeCamp. I'm the chair of psychiatry at University Hospitals and at Case School of Medicine. I'm really delighted that so many people could be here today to honor one of our faculty members who has had an incredible impact on the case community, Dr. Michelle Romero. So I've known Michelle for the entire time that I have been at UH as a faculty member. She was in the very first class of second year residents who rotated on the consultation liaison service with myself and other faculty the very first year I was in attending. And I'm going to restrain myself from telling too many tales of, of that particular time. But Michelle, suffice it to say, was thoughtful, careful, diligent, and serious about her clinical endeavors. Even as a second year resident back in 2008, Michelle showed early interest for clinical work with young adult patients. Little did, little did I know exactly how formidable and long lasting her presence would be, both within our department and at CASE and both the department and case are better for it. Michelle is truly the cornerstone of our department's presence at case, spanning from education to patient care. She is an enthusiastic member of multiple clinical committees as related to junior medical student education and our residency training program. And of course, she is on myriad committees through her work at case. Importantly, Michelle has directly contributed to expanding clinical education for our residents from routine rotations to advanced training opportunities in college mental health. But most of all, Michelle has emerged as a clinician leader on the broader case campus, effectively partnering with Dr. Sarah Lee and others to operationalize the provision of crucial mental health services to students in need. As Dr. Lee will expand upon, uh, Dr. Romero not only takes opportunities, she makes them. Michelle has been instrumental in multiple clinical initiatives, and she responds effectively to real-time issues and demands as they arise. Michelle models a kind, non-judgmental demeanor in all of her endeavors, certainly something which is effective with colleagues, trainees, and patients alike. She recognizes unique challenges in her patient population 
and she works successfully with leadership both at the department and at the university. Over years, she has built additional skill sets from grant management to clinical service creation, and she certainly does not shy away from hard work. Some of the most enduring elements of Michelle include her calm and constant presence, her almost limitless spirit, and her total devotion to the very special and unique work in which she engages. She truly models the excellence of care and caring that our department strives to embody, and she inspires others to follow in her footsteps. I'm really thrilled for Michelle to be recognized this afternoon as the inaugural chairholder of the Professorship in Psychiatry to sustain the prevention, identification, early intervention, and fellowship training program for young adult mental health services. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sarah Lee, who is the Assistant Vice President of University Health and Counseling Services and Chief Health Officer at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you, Dr. LeCamp, and thank you, uh, Dean Gerson and Dr. Aranis, uh, for your unwavering support of Dr. Romero, as well as your continued support of college student mental health. The best thing about Michelle, and there are many best things about Michelle, is that she always knows what to say, and more importantly, just how to say it. When I pick up the phone to call Michelle about a distressed student, which could frankly happen later tonight, I know that she will be calm, thoughtful, and utterly unflappable. And most importantly, she'll provide a brilliant answer, a well-considered plan seemingly with no effort. Michelle doesn't apply those skills solely to individual patient care. Like other campus centers across the country, University Health and Counseling Services uh, mental health appointments fill up quickly, especially in the fall when students newly transition into the university. As part of that process, those needing psychiatric medications are referred into psychiatry. Sounds great, students need help, students get help. But psychiatry in particular, as many of you know, is a limited resource. We increasingly found that psychiatry appointments quickly filled in August and September. By late October, all of the psychiatry slots were needed for follow-up appointments. As a result, the wait for a new psychiatry appointment was months. Michelle's training, coupled with her innate understanding of this age group, of their needs, not just as emerging young adults, but also as students, meant that she knew that timeline was way too long. A wait of even one month means that a student must navigate more than a quarter of the semester without needed care. Now, some caregivers would go to their bosses and demand that they figure out a way to fix it. A few might even go straight to their boss's boss. <laughs> While such approaches might make the demander feel better about themselves, they wouldn't actually do anything to address the problem. Michelle's combination of intellect, integrity, and compassion led her to a far more constructive strategy. She developed a pilot project, got support, and began to implement it. As many of you know, many mental health concerns can be managed in primary care, particularly when primary care providers can quickly connect with a really good psychiatrist. For example, relatively uncomplicated instances of depression, anxiety, and ADHD are among the conditions that pediatricians, internists, and family medicine physicians frequently manage within their practices. Michelle designed a really innovative decision-making algorithm to allow students who are already stable on a medication and newly arrived to the university or experiencing new and relatively uncomplicated symptoms to be cared for by our primary care providers. As this new model went into practice, Michelle sought ongoing feedback uh, from our truly interprofessional team of nurses, psychologists, social workers, and physicians. She incorporated that feedback into the algorithm, checked back in with those providers again and again. She heard a lot of feedback. And ultimately, she got the wait time down to two weeks or less. And did I mention she did all of that while also managing her own caseload? Michelle is dedicated to making a difference. She cares about each individual student, both the ones she treats personally and those who thanks to her efforts, are able to receive the treatments they need from others in a way that's both effective and timely. I'm delighted to be here to honor Michelle's work, and it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Michelle Romero.
Wow, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you uh, so much to both Dr. Zakamp and Lee for both your kind introductions and for your ongoing mentorship. Um, thank you also to Dean Gerson uh, for this incredible opportunity and to my parents and my husband for supporting me along this crazy journey. <laughs> this is me um, at my high school graduation party with my grandma B. I had told her probably around the age of 11 or 12 that I was going to be a doctor someday. She and the rest of my family believed that this is something that I could really do. Um, sadly, my grandma passed away before I started undergrad, but during our many visits with her that summer, every time before we left, I heard from her, you're going to be the best doctor someday. So off to the University of Dayton, I went to study pre-med. Along the way, there were a few changes in my course of study. After organic, I was done with chemistry and switched from pre-med to biology. <laughs> and I started taking a lot of psychology classes and I found them fascinating. So fascinating that I eventually picked up enough courses to, to pick up a double major in psychology. And I started having some serious conversations with my parents, mentors at UD, and with myself. Uh, yes, I talk to myself sometimes <laughs> um, about going on to graduate school to become a PhD psychologist. But I had said a long time ago that I was going to be a doctor someday. So I stuck true to my original plan, uh, but uh, my mind was not set just yet on becoming a psychiatrist. Next stop, Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Here I am on the left with my parents after my white coat ceremony, uh, just a pluripotent stem cell of a student um, who could become anything, right? What, what would I do? Uh, would I become an emergency medicine doctor like my mom thought from watching the hit show ER? Uh, possibly a pediatrician, a neurologist, a family medicine doctor, a cardiologist. Who knew? Psychiatry still was not at the forefront of my mind. The problem was that while all of those fields and more were both interesting and meaningful, none of them held my interest like psychiatry. To see someone come into the hospital fully manic or psychotic and in just days see them walk out, put back together, was fascinating and rewarding. I enjoyed hearing their stories and really digging into the person underneath the symptoms and the illness. This, I thought, is a field in which I can practice both the science of medicine as well as the art of healing. On the bottom right, you can see I'm pictured uh, with my husband, ready to start my journey towards becoming a psychiatrist. On to Case and University Hospitals for my general psychiatry training, where I first learned that I could work on a college campus with students. How cool is that? <laughs> I had loved college and everything that comes with those four plus years of school. And this 18 to 25 year old age range is also the primary time for the onset of mental illness. I want to help these young adults make it through college because their life path will be so much better if they graduate. I'd like to quickly say thank you to many who helped make this a reality. Um, Drs. Andrea Stoller, Mary Ellen Davis, Katie Cerny, Sue Kimmel, Farah Munir, Pat Runnels, Robert Ronis, and again, Dr. Sarah Lee and Jean LeCamp. Whether it was introducing me to this field, helping me with career advice, mentoring me in the college mental health arena, or creating a brand new fellowship track, or even just understanding that this population was special and deserves specialized care, I could not be where I am today without these remarkable people. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about what I do and why. Simply speaking, I take care of college students, but why does this population need specialized care? Transitional age youth are those young adults between the ages of 18 and 25 years old, and about 30% of those will experience uh, symptomatic mental illness. But of those 30%, only about a third are receiving any sort of treatment or care. The most dangerous impact of mental illness is suicide. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in this age group. And the second leading cause of death 
on college campuses. Of those with mental illness, 86% will withdraw prior to graduation compared to just 45% of the general student population. And life expectancy for college, the college educated is eight and a half years longer than those without a bachelor's degree. In addition to taking care of college students, I really enjoy working together to improve the quality of care we provide to them. And one highlight and proud moment for me was a project that Sarah referenced in her remarks uh, at University Health and Counseling Services, uh, in which we were able to reduce wait times for those initial appointments from six weeks down to two weeks and maintain that. So from a third of their semester to a couple of weeks. There was also a prompt to discuss how this work impacts the lives of, of people, and I think this is best said through the words of others. Thank you so much for all of your work on the MAC Mental Health Summit. Your efforts truly made a great impact on the attendees and our institutions. Thank you for being a reminder of why I chose this profession and for being such an amazing preceptor. Since graduating in December, Dean's High Honors and summa cum laude, I started working and even got into medical school. Things are going well for me and I am proud to say that this is the first time in three years I haven't experienced my annual fall depression. Thank you for supporting me during the times I struggled and for helping me reach this point. Thank you again for being a huge part of my recovery. Another focus of this work that I haven't had the chance to discuss yet is education. It is rewarding to educate and train colleagues and future generations of caregivers of this unique population. Looking to the future, I remain committed to the training of health providers in this field. A reimagined fellowship could be multi-specialty, including psychiatry, family medicine, adolescent medicine, and internal medicine. Our mission is to create skilled providers specializing in college and traditional aged youth who are prepared to become leaders in the field. As we continue to develop, test, and improve the care we are providing to students on campus, our goal is to become a learning laboratory for other programs and professionals looking to improve the quality of care they are providing to this unique and important population. I am grateful for our donors who wish to remain anonymous. I have had the fortunate opportunity to meet with them several times and each and every time their passion and dedication to this population was at the forefront of our discussions. It has been of the utmost importance to them to help adolescents and young adults needing mental help and bridging the gap between early childhood and adult mental health. Of particular interest to our donors is helping young adults gain access to appropriate mental health care while they are away from home and pursuing higher education. My passion for caring for college students began early in my career. I am interested and fortunate to be able to create this career path and looking forward to the ways that we can continue to expand our knowledge and reach. I am grateful for the opportunities this chair will afford in continuing to foster the mental health and well being of college students and transitional aged youth. Thank you. You don't get to leave yet because I get to, <laughs> I have to figure out which chair this is exactly. <laughs> well, I guessed right. So, good. Oh. so you get to come right over here. And uh, one more round of applause for your. appointment as the inaugural and we hope long-standing uh, uh, position as the endowed professorship of psychiatry to sustain the prevention identification early intervention and fellowship training for young adult mental health uh, services and uh, the focus here at Case Western we hope it is long-standing and congratulations thank you I'll let you go. Thank you. I'll move on to our second professorship, as I briefly introduced, uh, made possible through the 
uh, extraordinary generosity of the extended uh, Sealer family, a, a family with a long and storied history in the field of psychiatric care here in the uh, Cleveland area. And you may not all be aware of just how long and celebrated that is. So Dr. Christian um, Sealer was born in 1848. I mentioned to you that 1906 was the first professorship. He went on to become the, the, a highly respected physician, researcher, writer, and founder at both Windsor Hospital and Lutheran Hospital, celebrated names of, of, of hospital care here in the city of Cleveland. And Dr. Seeler earned his uh, medical degree at the University of Michigan, a medical school. I uh, spent a few years at the University of Berlin pursued his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins, returned to Cleveland in 1881, and opened a thriving private practice in neuropsychiatry, which in, in 1898 became Windsor Hospital. Uh, Dr. Seeler served as a professor of psychiatry at uh, Cleveland Medical College, Worcester College, and then right here at the Medical School of Case Western uh, University, not Reserve at the time, but Case, uh, sorry, Western Reserve University, not Case Western. So, for more than 120 years, Windsor Hospital, now Windsor uh, Laurelwood uh, Center for Behavioral Health in Willoughby, has treated patients suffering from a variety of neurological conditions, psychiatric disorders, chemical dependency, with a compassion um, and interest in long term care for those individuals. And as you heard, certainly that is a long term need. We're certainly delighted that offspring of the family, Carolyn uh, Sealer, is able to join us here this evening. Uh, she is the wife of the late Herbert Sealer, who was the grandson of Christian Sealer. Herb uh, passed away back in uh, 1915. 2015. 2015. 2015. Did I say no, thank you? 2015. It says it right here, 2015, so I should have known better. Herb Jr. kept on the tradition of the family working at Windsor Hospital, um, from kitchen to lawn care, um, ultimately succeeding his uncle, Paul Sealer, as president in 1964. That was 1964. Herb served uh, the mental health needs of families and patients for 22 years, providing care and a supportive atmosphere. And he was president until the hospital was sold in August of 1986. Herb helped build Windsor's stellar reputation. Uh, although the campus was closed in 2007, the legacy lives, lives on, as I mentioned, in Windsor Laurelwood Center for Behavioral Medicine. Uh, the proceeds of that sale were used to help establish the Sealer Mental Health Foundation. And as President Herb continued to serve the community by reviewing uh, and awarding grants to nonprofits. And to tell us a little bit more, I'd like to invite uh, whom I just met, uh, Reverend Ellis Tuck uh, Bauerfind, to offer remarks on behalf of the um, Sealer family. Dr. Um, Reverend Bauerfind is a Cleveland native, of course, uh, was a former associate rector of St. Paul's uh, close by in Cleveland Heights, and is currently the rector at the Grace Episcopal Church in Lexington, Virginia. His uh, connections to the medical school are many. His sister Jane uh, is a 1991 graduate. Brother William, uh, also a 1991 graduate. His father, Edgar Pete Bauerfein, was a graduate in 1949. Um, happens to have been Herb Sealer's cousin and a dear friend. Now, I worked directly uh, with Pete. We're both trained hematologists, and when I joined the faculty, he was uh, one of the four senior faculty that I got to uh, present to as a young assistant professor. It was a humbling experience because he knew a hell of a lot more of hematology than I did, and I had to defend every decision I made, and, and um, I'm still humbled by remembering those conversations. So, Tuck, I welcome you to the stage uh, for your comments and tell us a little further about the family and their interest in this professorship. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Gerson. Uh, so nice to meet you and to learn about your connection with my dad, uh, who uh, never graduated from college, uh, graduated from medical school uh, through the U.S. Air Force in Nebraska, and did a residency here at um, at uh, Case, um, but served uh, here on the on the staff of the medical school for. I believe close to 40 years, uh, during which he taught a generation of medical students about doctor-patient relationships and ethics, um, both of which he had a passion for. Um, Herb and my dad had um, were, were kind of like brothers. Uh, my dad was an only child, I grew up in this community. Herb was. Uh, his closest relative, uh, along with their other cousin, John Sealer. Um, so they, they had a close relationship. Uh, um, it, it wasn't always uh, the smoothest relationship, but they, they worked together well over those years uh, since 19, 1986 to 1999, I guess it was, uh, distributing grants. Uh, from the proceeds of the sale of the hospital, and they, I think they both loved doing that, and they loved establishing this endowed chair. Um, in your opening remarks, you, you remarked that the first endowed chair in the country was at a divinity school, um, and that, didn't, that seemed like a, a disconnect because it was a chair in physics, uh, you mentioned, and, uh, and I, I thought briefly about that. You know, it, they used to be the same thing. Uh, divinity and physics uh, both were, uh, and to some extent I think still are, animated by the search for truth, for reality. And um, But th they diverged at a certain point in terms of their focus when it became somewhat clear through observation that no one was finding uh, God as an observable entity. Um, and physics began to develop its own uh, set of algorithms and studies, and uh, divinity began to uh, to look in other places. Um, but I I think that today there there is a, a reintegration of those disciplines in some ways um, uh, that that we do see that uh, the the health studies. Um, as, a, as our previous chair speaker speaking, are deeply connected to relationships, uh, to, um, to something I guess we can, we can all agree on, might, we might call love, and uh, that I at least come from a branch of divinity to, that sees uh, the study of love uh, as deeply uh, about the character of God. Um, and so, uh, so divinity and 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 maybe physical sciences are have still have a deep connection, although uh, they're obviously chaired in different schools these days. Um, I have this button on, by the way. Uh, pause to connect. It's our campus ministry at Grace Episcopal Church in Lexington. Uh, parishioners bring their dogs to the courtyard. Students stop by. And the College of Washington and Lee now says that that program is one of their top mental health programs. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's somewhat accidental, but mer maybe serendipitous. And I, I also just wanted to point out that uh, Harper, class of 25, uh, Jane's daughter is here. Uh, and my, uh, my brother, Peter, who worked in the hospital for 37 years, um, uh, worked on healing, uh, because healing takes all these different dim dimensions. Uh, Peter l worked in services in the hospital for 37 years. Um, you mentioned my brother and my sister. My wife, Delia, is a, a graduate of the School of Social Work here and you know, with an MSSA in 92, and she, uh, she works in uh, the hospice of Rockbridge. Well, it's called Connections Plus Healthcare and Hospice now. Um, so uh, we, 
we do have a continuing legacy of healing in this in this family and and i guess the last thing that that i'd say just about the history christian sealer and i'm so glad you told that history because then i didn't have to repeat it um christian sealer was born in fort wayne indiana um, his dad was uh, a lutheran pastor uh, and the founder of uh, concordia seminary a, a, a lutheran uh, a missouri synod uh, seminary there in fort wayne indiana and um and he and his family uh came out of that you know that previous i think tradition of uh physical science and uh and and divinity being more closely intertwined um i believe that a lot of healers including my dad uh although it took him time to recognize it i think uh did a lot of their work out of that uh out of their spiritual life um, I think they still do, um, and and I think that the reintegration of those fields is is important for the success of both. Uh, healing and health uh, is, at some level, I think, uh, deeply about relationships, about uh, connections, about the reintegration and wholeness of things. And um, and I I want to celebrate Dr. Janata. Uh, I want to celebrate the work of the uh, the medical school and this university and and contributing to that uh, that health and wholeness in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Atak, for those deep and thoughtful comments. And I am reading a uh, uh, Stephen Hollings book on the origins of the universe and the overlap um, with divinity is quite quite real in his mind so thank you for that um, and thank you again uh, uh, to Carolyn Seeler and the family's incredible support for this professorship um, it is the case that Bob uh, Ronis uh, called me a few years ago and said you know, um, the next professorship holder has to be Jeffrey Janata. And I said, oh, I was a brand new dean. And so I said, who's Jeffrey Janata? And then I did a little homework and I got it quickly. Um, so it is, and you will be proud of this appointment as you get to know uh, Jeffrey uh, well. So to tell you a bit more, I'd love to, but I have to keep an order. So I'll turn it again back over to uh, Jeannie Langkamp. Uh, and then to former uh, chair uh, Bob Ronis to tell you why. So, Jeannie. All right. I am thrilled to participate in this long awaited investiture of Dr. Jeffrey Janata into the Sealer Family Professorship in Psychiatry. I will admit it. Writing this introduction felt daunting. How could I best describe Jeff's body of work? How could I possibly summarize what Jeff means to our department and to the university? Moreover, how could I do all of that without A, taking an inordinate amount of time, B, being too digressive, or C, sounding vaguely like the president and founding member of the Jeff Janata fan club? As to the first and second concerns, of course, I've sorted out my comments. As to the last, well, we'll just have to accept that one. As a fellow in behavioral medicine, Jeff was recruited to Case in 1984, after which he joined the department as a faculty member and straight out of the gate as associate director of the Behavior Therapy Clinic. Starting then and never ceasing, Jeff has been a force for clinical care, training, and advancement. His astounding knowledge base and skill set regarding the psychological care of chronically medically ill patients has spanned from diabetes and weight management to chronic pain to extensive work in women's mental health. At the risk of sounding cliche, he has built bridges to other departments, including endocrinology, neurology, anesthesiology, and OBGYN during times that that was incredibly unique. 
having psychological input into chronic medical conditions was far from routine in the 1980s and sadly can still prove challenging to this day. But by virtue of his engagement, his passion, and his sheer force of will and impact, Jeff has led myriad collaborations across our hospital and across Case Campus. Many learners have benefited from Jeff's educational efforts, from Case Medical students to MSAS students to psychology interns and fellows to psychiatry trainees. Notably, Jeff's natural desire to teach clinicians how to interface effectively with patients has been borne out with established clinicians as well in everything from our locally created pain management workshops to his four PCP work with primary care providers. In this way, Jeff not only takes excellent care of patients, but he teaches others how to do so as well. On a personal note, since my arrival as a faculty member, I had known of Jeff and then I became fortunate enough to know Jeff. Particularly starting in 2018 during our hospital systems foray into pain management part de, Jeff was a gracious and interested partner. Able to share cautionary tales from programs gone by while remaining enthusiastic and dedicated to the patients we could help, Jeff has been a vital collaborator. Beyond just the Pain Management Institute, I have experienced Jeff's calm and steady presence, remarkably thoughtful counsel, talent for questioning without overtone, ability to share from his experiences without discouraging, and a knack for challenging yet supporting. I would be hard pressed to identify many faculty who have held such a role for me, and the key is, I know it's not just for me. Jeff actively cares for colleagues as he does his patients. He lightens burdens, eases worries, and creates space. As we ready ourselves for this long-awaited investiture, I am so pleased to introduce yet another August member of our department, Professor and Chair Emeritus, who was instrumental in Jeff's appointment to this endowed position, as Stan just mentioned, uh, Dr. Bob Ronis. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a terrific pleasure to be here today for uh, a wonderfully deserved uh, endowment, uh, now chair uh, investiture, as, as Jean has been saying. But uh, before that, I wanted to uh, congratulate Michelle. And uh, I'm just delighted that this, uh, this chair has evolved to the place where you are now going to be, at least for now, the chair holder, which is wonderful. And I have to say, uh, the donors, obviously, we owe a great debt of gratitude to. Uh, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Michelle, who was so instrumental in the creation of this chair, met with me several times with the donors. And I really think it was Michelle's passion, uh, dedication, uh, commitment, and uh, creativity that, that drew them into making this final decision to, to endow the professorship. Uh, so thank you and congratulations to you. Uh, I also want to thank the, uh, the, the Bauerfeind and the uh, Sealer family for uh, creating and, and sustaining this chair, which is just so important uh, to what we do. Um, there's a very fancy name for the chair, and there's a lot that goes behind it. But as it was explained to me by Dr. David Agel, by the way, also a consultation liaison psychiatrist, who was the, uh, the uh, inaugural uh, chairholder for the Sealer chair, the intent of the chair was for someone to teach doctors how to talk to patients. I believe that that really was the intent. Uh, uh, sadly, I believe that, that Herb was in the hospital quite a bit toward uh, the end of his life. And uh, I think he became quite concerned that uh, doctors didn't seem to have it anymore, if they ever did. And of course, we've gotten much more biologically focused. We have many more th pharmacotherapeutics that we can go through. Uh, but the most healing thing in most relationships between physicians and patients is the relationship itself. So you may find it a little peculiar uh, that we are uh, giving Dr. Janata this endowed chair as Dr. Janata is not an MD, he is a PhD. He is a psychologist uh, extraordinaire. And uh, in the current day and age, it certainly seems that 
the amount of psychotherapy that is undertaken by psychiatrists in particular, physicians in this field, has unfortunately become less and less because the shortage and the need is so great on the pharmacotherapeutic side. Doesn't mean that we don't need to learn how to talk to patients. Doesn't mean that we don't have healing relationships. But a lot of this teaching of how to talk with patients uh, has been become the realm of Dr. Janata and others in our psychology division. And as Jean mentioned, I think you came, what, a year out of your, uh, your, uh, your postdoctoral um, training, joined the faculty, and almost immediately became the division director for psychology. Um, there actually was a relatively sizable population in our psychology department at the time that Jeff joined. And then there was the great purge of the late uh, 1980s which we won't go into detail except to say that one of my predecessors felt that psychiatry departments should be populated by psychiatrists and that uh, psychologists were perhaps very nice, uh, good clinicians at times, but really didn't have a place in a medical school. Uh, thankfully, uh, his, uh, the f folks that followed him in this position felt differently. And uh, with Jeff's leadership, we really have built this into one of the most successful divisions of psychology around the country in a psychiatry department. And so it's altogether fitting that Dr. Janata is the first psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry to, re to receive an endowed professorship. And that is, once again, thanks to Carolyn Seeler, with whom we met, because the actual uh, gift agreement, I believe, is quite specific that this is a chair for a physician. Uh, our rationale, I think, was understood, and uh, Mrs. Seeler was willing to give us at least a one-time exception. So, Jeff, you got to hold this chair for a long time now. Um, but I, I really also appreciate uh, Dr. LeCamp's introduction uh, of Jeff's uh, academic uh, portfolio, as well as some of his, of his personal characteristics. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to publicly w congratulate Dr. LeCamp on being appointed chairman of the department. <laughs> Dr. LeCamp had a mere 20 months to wait for her appointment, uh, whereas Dr. Janata has waited uh, what is it now, 52 months for the, uh, no, not that many, I'm sorry, uh, but over two years, over two years for the uh, for this ceremony to occur. So we're just so delighted. I mean, I guess the great news for Dean Gerson is the reason it's been so delayed is the medical school has been so successful in creating new chairs that getting this on the schedule took two years. So, so we're so glad. I also wanted just to mention, I mean, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jeff uh, for four decades now. I was a second year resident in psychiatry in 1984 when Jeff was doing his postdoctoral fellowship and we got to know each other. Uh, I guess over the years we've gotten to look a little bit more like each other, although I never quite saw it. But we have had mutual patients, particularly when we were doing telepsychiatry, that seemed quite confused as to whether I was Dr. Janata or whether Jeff was Dr. Ranis, but we've worked it out. Uh, but Jeff is, as has already been said, a wonderful human being, a wonderful friend, a terrific leader for our department, a terrific leader within medicine, uh, and really has, throughout his career, focused much of his energy on teaching doctors how to talk to patients. You're going to hear from him, I'm sure, about his 4PCP program, which he and Tom Chalimsky, who I think is here in the audience, uh, there's Tom in the back, thank you for visiting, uh, put together some years ago and have pursued uh, very actively and is beginning to really catch fire around the country. And I'm not going to steal your thunder by saying more than just that. Uh, but we've continued to be friends. We've gotten to be friends with Susan. We've had an opportunity over the years to spend time together. Jeff and I now regularly um, share cholesterol over breakfast uh, once a month at Big Al's <laughs> and, uh, and uh, a wonderful friendship that will continue. I also wanted to mention if there's anyone here that needs an Airstream trailer, um, <laughs> although Jeff and Susan haven't yet used it, they now have two Airstream trailers uh, because the first one they decided wasn't quite good enough. So if anybody's looking, I think you can get a good deal. Anyway, Jeff, congratulations and welcome to the podium.
Bob, I'll be sure to make you a pretty good deal on that trailer if you like. <laughs> it's really an honor to be here today and an honor to, uh, to be introduced by Dean Gerson and by Dr. LeCamp and by Dr. Ronis and to follow Michelle Romero. Thank you for, all for being here. And I had a uh, professor of uh, speech, public speaking in college, who always said, if you're going to give a talk, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them that, and then remind them what you have told them. And I'll do my best to do that in the same sort of rich baritone that Tuck Bauerfein brought to the uh, podium. Thank you for your introduction, too. The theme of my talk today is that the richness of our lives comes by surrounding ourselves with people who bring out the best in us. That's true of our friendships, that's true of the people we select to be our partners, and that is certainly true of, oh, do I need to move this myself? I do, don't I? There we go. So. My story is of gratitude, and it is essentially the idea that if we are smart, and if we're lucky, if we are, are so privileged to, uh, to be surrounded by people who bring out the best in us, then we thrive, and we grow, and we do quite well. And I have been privileged, both adventitiously as well as intentionally, to surround myself with people who are bright and who are motivated, and I consider it one of the joys of my life to work in an institution where people are so gifted. So I want to tell you three stories about family, teachers, and colleagues. Family. I was raised in a family with a mother who was a theologian. She was ordained in the United Church of Christ and one of the early women who was ordained in that church. And at the dinner table, my mother, the theologian, and my father, the litigator, would have spirited conversations. And if one wanted to enter into this conversation, you had to bring a certain kind of precision of language and thoughtful discourse and discernment about your topics, else you'd be shuttled aside. And I learned at that table to formulate my thoughts and to make arguments and to be passionate about the things that I cared about in the midst of the Vietnam era where passions were rising high. And we talked about many things over that table and I, that was an adventitious one. I was surrounded by greatness growing up in my family. I had teachers and professors and mentors along the way many of them here, who brought that same sort of sense of richness to my life. And I was, and I, in, in particular, I guess, I want to talk about a teacher of physics in my high school. When I was interested, when I was 15 years old, I was interested in baseball and playing the drums. But I had a physics teacher who was as passionate about his subject. He was one of these teachers who used his body to just express how particles would move or how waves would move. And he was passionate about his subject. But what I learned from him was that it was more important to be passionate about your students. And you had to bring a kind of deep-seated interest in their well-being that's what began in me a love of physics and tuck somehow it turned into psychology. I think it's kind of the same thing. I also, Carolyn, who's an interest, who has a great interest in history, wanted to tell you a little bit about my grandfather. My grandfather was a medical school graduate of Western Reserve School of Medicine in the early 1900s and he was an ophthalmologist but he was part of a celebrated unit here that was called the Lakeside Unit. George Cryle and several others who ultimately founded the Cleveland Clinic were interested in getting, uh, in, in breaking through the isolationism of that early period of time and being a part of what was developing into the Great World War. And so my grandfather and some of his colleagues under the direction of George Cryle formed the Lakeside Unit, and he became a cavalry surgeon in the British Army. The kind of uh, 
passion that it takes for an American medical student to join the British Army because he felt so thoroughly how important it was to be a part of that effort uh, was a part of the greatness that I was surrounded by adventitiously. All right. So what exactly do I do here? You've heard a little bit about the, my history of working in, in various medical fields and trying to bring uh, psychological uh, mindedness, I guess, uh, uh, behavioral factors that contribute to all the various programs that at various times we've been a part of. But it's always emphasized the interplay of the biological and the psychological. And so we created this program. Some of the people who are here in the room helped with that development of that program. And we, we had yeah, interesting work that we were doing with patients and with practitioners alike. And in the midst of this, there was a pain program that was operated not by me, but by another of the people who worked in my clinic. And they abruptly left, and Dennis Landis, who was the chairman of neurology at the time, said to Tom Chalemsky, the neurologist in the, in the back here, and my longtime colleague and partner, uh, we'd like you to take this over. And he came to me and he said, well, we need somebody to do the psychology part of this program until we can hire somebody. <laughs> I should have known better, I suppose, that, it w that that temporary assignment would turn into a lifetime passion and pain. That was one of those advent adventitious moments. I got to partner with one of the truly brightest people I've ever known in Tom Chalemsky. Passionate about patients, passionate about his work, passionate about integrating the autonomics of, uh, uh, of pain with pain practice. And so we created a pain program that was remarkably successful. Clinically, we knocked it out of the park. Back to baseball. We knocked it out of the park. But we didn't do that well financially. We lost a little bit of money. And so that was the end of that program. But there was such a need in the community that we thought all these referring docs, all these patients who were coming to us, all of whom, all who uh, were benefiting from our program, couldn't we suppose we could teach the physicians in the community to do this same work? So we created the primary practice physician program for chronic pain for PCP, where we trained a small cohort of about 34 physicians from the Primary Care Institute here at UH to do in their offices what we were trying to do in an intensive outpatient program. And they succeeded beyond our expectations. They would tell us that pain was tough for them because they weren't really trained to do it. They were trained to treat acute pain, but chronic pain was a different animal. And we began to understand how important the role of the central nervous system was and how chronic pain really became a brain disease much more than it was just acute pain that stuck around for a while. So, we did this pilot program. It was successful. The physicians who were involved found that they enjoyed the work. They were satisfied with the work. Our, the patients got better and their visit times got shorter. Everybody won. And we thought, great, now we can take this and go to the next level. Despite our successes with this pilot program, and despite our best efforts to find somebody who would take the next step with us and do a large scale trial, um, solid idea, don't call us, we'll call you. We found nobody who was willing to take this on despite lots of attempts because the timing wasn't quite right. And then the timing got right. Then the opiate crisis hit. And all of a sudden, it became clear that the ways we were treating chronic pain in the main were creating more problems than they were solving. And that physicians who now, from a regulatory perspective, had to pull back on their opiate prescribing, and opiate prescribing was scrutinized, needed to have something else to bring to this complex pain issue that has multiple determinants, biological, psychological, and social determinants, all of them. They needed more in their toolkits to be able to effectively treat chronic pain. 
and our dusty pilot study suddenly became of interest. Suddenly this little entry in a journal uh, kind of speared a, a resurgence of interest and we were contacted by state medical boards, by health systems, by the state of Wisconsin. The Supreme Court of Ohio wanted to hear what we were doing. It was quite interesting. And so we moved from 4PCP 1.0 to 4PCP 2.0 and created a curriculum now to, 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 to train large groups, not 34 in a pilot program, but large groups of physicians in better strategies based on modern neuroscience for treating chronic pain. What we learned along the way was the importance of relationships and the importance of the fact that if you're gonna tackle a tough problem, you have to come at it from multiple directions. It's not enough to come at it as a biological phenomenon. We have to come at it from the psychological and the social as well. So we created this new program that trained not only the primary care physicians, but also trained them in creating a team and how it is that you can truly put together a team that's effective. And we used, as we did in the pilot program, a residency style training model where we practiced and had them practice the kind of language that now treating chronic pain really requires because we have to reconceptualize chronic pain now. It's not just my toe hurts and there's a sensory signal that goes to the brain. Now it's what's the brain doing with that signal and how can we reorient the brain to interpret it in a different way. That was the goal, and that's the program we've been working on. It has now expanded and become codified, and we're distributing it um, much more broadly. So I want to thank the people who were involved in both sides of that program. The first 4PC program I've listed here, and, and, and I'm just thrilled and overwhelmed that so many people are here from that program from Dr. Chilinski and Dr. Levin, who is a now a spectacular researcher in our department who joined us and Ted Perrin and Sybil Marsh and others. And our second generation group, which is some of the, you know, we've, we've taken some from the old and mixed with some of the new, and they're listed here. And I'm very grateful to them for the relationships that they've created with me and for the ways in which they surrounded me with their greatness. I, I, I need to express terrific gratitude to the Seeler family. Um, this, is a, this is a challenging effort. This is a reconceptualization of the thing that brings most patients to see docs. Pain is something that chronic pain in particular is not well trained in our medical system. And the docs that we talk to would often say, uh, I, I don't feel as though I have the tools to treat this population effectively. So it, this is very much, I think, in the spirit of the sealer uh, idea of, of teaching physicians, teaching practitioners, teaching psychologists how to talk to patients about the pain they're experiencing. So I want to extend my great gratitude to Herbert Seeler, whom I didn't have the privilege of knowing, to Carolyn, who I do, and we go out for a lunch on occasion, uh, and all the work that they've done through the years from Windsor Hospital to today. Um, I, I'm delighted to meet Tuck and Delia. I didn't say that right, did I? Delia Bauerfeind and, and Peter Bauerfeind, whom I have known from St. Paul's Church, and to meet Harper today. And I want to acknowledge the previous chairs, the inaugural chairholder, Doug, uh, David Agel, uh, who was a good friend and colleague, and Susan Stagno, who immediately uh, held the chair before I did. And I'm very humbled by people who have come to support me and, and, and be a part of this day. Uh, I'm, I have a long-standing and deep sense of uh, respect and, and affection for Dr. Ronis. I'm thrilled beyond measure that Dr. LeCamp has been appointed the new chair of psychiatry. Uh, we are in terrific hands in her leadership and delighted to support her in any way we can. To Dr. Chalimsky, who is my partner in crime, uh, I owe a lot. He's a true friend and a, and, a, and a wonderful collaborator and mentor. To Dr. Levin, who's become one of the research stars in our department, I'm so delighted that uh, she came and that she stuck around. 
to Dr. Hamilton, who is one of my oldest friends. He was a, uh, a graduate school colleague, and he and I are collaborators in, in understanding factitious illness and illness behavior, and also how flies will attract a trout. To my friend David Paul, who is a, f a former student and is so bright that the single career wasn't enough for him, and his lovely wife, Kathy McCluskey, who's name is misspelled here. I apologize. And to my family, Susan Carver, who is, is talk about being surrounded by greatness. I feel very lucky every day. Uh, my kids, Chris and Emily are here with uh, Chris with his lovely wife, Gemma, who graces our presence from Wales, and Emily, who is a nurse practitioner in psychiatry, and, uh, his, and her fiance, Sam and grandchildren who actually were going to be here for a while until the schedule changed, so they're not here, but I'll acknowledge them anyway. Thank you all. And, and just a couple things more. I probably over time. It was important to me that our staff be here too. We have faculty invitations always going out to uh, any time we do one of these events, and they're very special, and I'm very honored to be here. But it's important when we think about the greatness that we surround ourselves with, that we recognize the people who collaborate with us in doing the service that we do. So there are many people here today on the staff as well as the faculty, and I want to acknowledge them and thank them for being here. So finally, thank you to the Seeler family. Thank you, Dean Gerson. Thank you, Dr. LeCamp, and thank you, Dr. Ronis. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm very honored and very grateful. So I hope it's no surprise to anyone in the room that we're going to ask you to have a seat thank you. in your chair. And I thank you, and I'm honored to be able to let you sit as the, and I'll make sure I get it right here, the uh, Sealer Family Professor of Psychiatry. Congratulations, Jeffrey. Thanks. Thank you. And in my uh, closing comments, I just want the department to recognize um, how, for the School of Medicine, how proud this department is. There are an incredible number, everyone is cherished, of professorships in the department. A remarkable number of them were created by members, friends, family uh, of the department. And it sustains the department now, and it certainly will in the future. And this dean is just proud for all of you and proud to be here. So thank you very much. I think we've done a lot of uh, photography, so I think we can all spread out. Uh, we'll have a brief reception in the back. Thank you for joining us.